we have a real treat now, and, uh, and I did say uh, briefly to, to Dr. Brzezinski that Winston Lord went out of his way to praise in unheralded terms the great trip that he took in September of 1978, and, and May, May of 1978, and uh, it was, uh, it was a, so I'm going to use that as the only bridge. Everyone knows uh, Dr. Zbigniew Brzezinski. Uh, he was the national security advisor in the Carter administration, instrumental in formally establishing diplomatic relations between China and the United States. And, uh, and of course, everyone knows David Ignatius. I look forward to, I don't know which I enjoy reading more, his column or his novels, but each of them are stimulating and interesting and endlessly fruitful. So let me turn it to you uh, to get us started, David. Thank Great. You. Thank you, John. I should just say you're allowed to read both. There's nothing that says you have to choose between fiction or nonfiction. Um, it's great to be part of, of the, the greatest uh, book party of all time, Dr. Kissinger. Uh, and uh, sitting here with Zbigniew Brzezinski honoring uh, Dr. Kissinger and his book, I am reminded of a phrase I heard as a student, as an undergraduate of Harvard, a professor named Samuel Beer, who some people may remember, used to give his lectures in what we called Sock Sci II. Uh, and he, he would talk about the great chain of being, which was this wonderful medieval concept of an ordered universe. And in, in my mind, I don't know about all that medieval stuff, but there is a great chain of being when it comes to national security. And, and that great chain of being uh, flows through Henry Kissinger and through Brent Scowcroft and through Zbigniew Brzezinski and then back again through Brent Scowcroft. And it's one of the really important and powerful things in our, in our country and what keeps it going. So I, I think of this in part as a celebration of the great chain of being. And so with that as an introduction, let me turn to uh, Dr. Brzezinski and we're going to talk a little bit about the book on China and we're going to talk a little bit about China and maybe some other issues too. Uh, but uh, Zbigniew, I want to begin by asking you the, the, the core question at the center of Dr. Kissinger's book and any contemporary discussion of China, uh, which is, are we fated to come in conflict with a rising China? Uh, there, there's a particularly interesting passage toward the end of Dr. Kissinger's book in which he's citing a memo that was written by a, a British uh, Foreign Service officer, and I'm going to mispronounce his name, but it's Ayer Crow. Do I have that right? Uh, we, we think of the Crow mem memorandum uh, in terms of Admiral Crow, but this was a, a much earlier Crow. And he was essentially saying, when you look at a rising Germany, the questions of good faith, of negotiation, of all of the attributes that statecraft might bring to, the, to this discussion matter less than the objective fact that this country is getting richer, more powerful, bigger weight in the world, and that if it, uh, and he made naval armament the centerpiece of his analysis, if, if it goes forward with that armament, nothing else matters, that, you, that the objective correlates, if you will, uh, mean that, that uh, confrontation is, is, is implicit. So let me ask you to, to take that as a starting point. Okay. Well, are we fated to become enemies? When you asked me that, I thought immediately of Henry and myself. <laughs> <laughs> so I hope that Henry, when he's up here, will associate himself with what it was reported Winston Lord was saying about me. That'll be the answer to that. <laughs> but the answer is under suspension until we hear that affirmation. <laughs> the same is true of the American-Chinese relationship. Uh, both sides have to make an effort. Uh, and I think both sides are aware of the fact, I really do believe they're aware of the fact that their fates are somewhat interwoven, and therefore the better part of wisdom is to try to be friends. Maybe friends is too much, but quite seriously, I think we have clearly an awareness, at least on the sort of serious policy level in this country, that demonizing China is not a policy. It's a form of escapism. 
and it's a self-damaging escapism. I think the Chinese leadership has become somewhat more aware of that in recent months as well, in terms of its own uh, attitude. Uh, if I may say so, I think I contributed a little bit to it in a number of private meetings with the leaders of the Chinese military and also with Chinese senior officials, and also in one meeting at which you, Henry, were there, where I sort of started doing the same act, namely reading to them what some of their serious journals are saying, reading back to them some of the things that their military are saying about us and how it impacts on our attitudes and how it interplays with those here who also spontaneously or for some other motives lean towards the demonization of China. Uh, my sense is that the Chinese in the last several months have seriously tried to tone down that anti-American analysis. I, for one, who follow this, uh, you know, reasonably responsibly, uh, have been struck by the fact that there's much less of it lately. But there was a kind of crescendo rising in the course of the last year and a half, getting close to a peak late last year, and then because of a variety of inputs, and I don't want to claim mine was so decisive, but I certainly made a point of making it to the Chinese leaders, there was a change. And then we had the articles by Councillor uh, Dai, kind of, you know, a positive, constructive vision of China's role in the world. And um, what's his name, Zhang Bijan? Bijan, what's his first name? Yeah. Zhang Bijan, also, who is the chief ideologist, has written major pieces reaffirming again the content of the proposition, China peacefully rising, harmonious world, and so forth. Now, I say this, and incidentally, these questions are not prearranged, so this wasn't a prepared speech, but this is an important question. These things are dynamic, and they're really dependent on the goodwill and determination and vision of the leaderships of both societies, and in our society, of the more informed mass media. I am worried that in our mass media and in our political partisanship, we may be less able to control volatile public opinion. So that is a risk. But I think the relationship is altogether different from that that prevailed between imperial Germany in 1914 and Great Britain in 1914. So I'm on the whole uh, cautiously optimistic. And in your mind, is there a, a red line in this uh, memorandum written in 1907 about a rising uh, Germany, uh, the red line was a sub significant naval armament by Germany that would challenge uh, Britain's the dominance uh, of, this, of the oceans and its ability to, to maintain its empire. Is there a similar um, red line in your mind as you think about China, that if they proceeded down a certain path that would, that would then lead you to say, as, as much as we like the nice things that people sometimes say, objectively speaking, we have a problem. Well, we may have more objectively speaking problem. Um, you know, on what grounds can we say to the Chinese, you're not entitled to an uh, oceanic navy? I mean, on what grounds? We're entitled to have a navy that can be deployed in the Far Eastern Pacific, um, but they're not entitled to an oceanic navy that can reach out, let's say, towards Hawaii, or that can somehow or other pass through the Strait of Malacca and be present in the Indian Ocean. If I were Chinese, I would say my strategic security depends on the ability to operate freely on the oceans. And the ability to operate freely on the oceans for a major power cannot be a benign gift from a more powerful other state. It has to be intrinsic to their own capabilities. So that is a question that we can resolve, but we have managed to deal even with a much more belligerent, short-sighted, and in its latter phases, incompetent Soviet leadership we have established a situation of, in effect, a kind of nuclear interdependence. Even though we started off with a massive edge, then they decided to catch up. We decided not to go to war to prevent them from doing it. 
And I certainly don't think that we would be very productive in terms of our national interest if we went to some sort of a conflict with China to prevent them from having something which inherently a great power like China is entitled to have. Inevitably, and, and my question certainly focused you in this direction, uh, in speaking about red lines, you're speaking about ways of projecting power that, that we could call uh, legacy systems, uh, a deep water navy, uh, the ability to transit the Straits of Malacca. I mean, those are images that could arise any time over the last uh, 150, uh, 200 years. When I ask, in my, in my rare visits to China, when I ask Chinese uh, defense analysts uh, this question, I get an interesting answer from one in particular who's a prominent uh, uh, professor at Fudan University in Shanghai named Deng Li Shen. And uh, he says, why would we want to contest you in the Straits of Malacca? We have no interest in building a legacy system to rival yours at enormous expense. These are the weapons of the past. What we want is to be able to go into the battle spaces of the future. We want to be, be very powerful in space systems. We want to have the, the cyber and other uh, new weapons, beam weapons, other related weapons, that will allow us to disable your command and control of your fleet at sea that you have, have put out at enormous expense and, and all of your systems. We want to be able to take out any tank, any ship, uh, by new means, new technologies, and that's where we're going. And I wonder if you'd speak to that. In other words, you know, when we think about drawing lines, there are sort of lines in the past where we've already been, and that's not where, where the issues will be 5, 10, 20 years out. Well, I'm not sure if that's where the issues will be 20, 25 years from now. They may both be operative, so to speak. If I were a Chinese military person talking to you, I would certainly not go out of my way to arouse your anxieties or to get you to say things that will arouse more assertive American conduct. I would sort of play it low key um, and try to do whatever is possible within their reach. Um, for the Chinese, sure, competing with us in the sort of new dimensions of global power is obviously an important challenge and one that they probably feel they have to meet in the longer run. But in the shorter run, they also do have a problem of secure access to something that they desperately need and which passes through the Indian Ocean and then through the Strait of Malacca. And they may well feel, and rightly so, that they don't want to be dependent on the goodwill of their neighbors or perhaps on us helping them even, which would be long stretch and for which we would probably demand a price. Uh, so they will try to work around that. This doesn't mean some sort of a naval confrontation between the Chinese and the Indians, but it means a capability to project their power. It also means, and there are a lot of reports on this, uh, the establishment of some sort of presence on the Indian Ocean in uh, western, southwestern Pakistan, the port of Gardir, or whatever it's called exactly, and they seem to be exploring that, building a road, building a pipeline, perhaps building a base, those, I think, are kind of sensible uh, elements of what obviously is a regional competition and some degree of regional reassurance for something that is vital. Beyond that, they are beginning to ask themselves, I've noticed that in their analyses, they're beginning to ask themselves, what are the implications for them of what is becoming apparent to them, also to me, of America's decline in the Middle East. Because, you know, we have been the dominant power in the Middle East for the last uh, 50, 60, 65 years or so. And I think that power is rather rap rapidly declining these days for a variety of reasons connected with our policies and errors, misconceptions, and even deceptions. But whatever the motive is for the Chinese, what is, of course, of importance is what happens if well, we decline. Let, and then what should be their role in the Middle East? And they may need the Navy in that connection as well. 
Let's stay with that for a moment, and, uh, and let me ask you, how, how worried should we be about the reports that uh, uh, Bandar bin Sultan is making a secret uh, mission to, uh, to China to talk about the Saudi Arabia's concern about declining American power and its desire for, for better relations with, uh, uh, with China. Uh, that, that comes at the same time that uh, uh, the Pakistanis are, are, are signaling uh, quite dramatically the, their, their, their sense that uh, whatever their problems with the United States, uh, they have a, a, a good and, 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 and improving relationship with China. A Pakistani official said to me recently, at last we're on the right side of history. Uh, our, our relationship with America may be going to hell, but you know, the, the new rising superpower, you know, that they're our best friends. Um, sh sh when we hear talk like that, when we read about Bandar going to China, should we be nervous? Or should we say, uh, welcome to the Mideast mess? Uh, Chinese brothers and sisters? Well, I think we should be concerned about what we are doing or have not been doing and what it means for our position. Uh, because our decline in the Middle East is not ordained by history. It's a byproduct of our short-sightedness, absence of leadership, uh, political opportunism, uh, and indifference into some basic geopolitical or even moral dimensions of some of the problems involved. Um, it's a problem of our making. And I think we have to address that. But that does not necessarily involve China. We have to address that anyway, because we have such a stake, political, geopolitical, and moral, in the Middle East, that it's in our interest to address it. And the fact of the matter is that for decades now, our leadership has been on the whole more skillful in evasion than in, 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 in policy making. It's, it's programmed to go off when you talk about the Middle East. Yes, it usually happens. <laughs> While they're uh, fixing that, let me talk with you for a minute about, about the context in which you uh, dealt with China, dealt, dealt with Deng Xiaoping, and the context in which Dr. Kissinger dealt uh, with Zhou Enlai. In that context was our concern about a strong, you can argue about whether it was perceived at the time as rising. My recollection is that it was seen as a rising Soviet Union. And, and here was a chance to, to, to get a natural ally, an unconventional one, uh, against the, our common enemy. Well, one analogous situation uh, is as we look at this rising China and try to figure out how much of a threat it is, uh, we look a little closer in Asia and we see a rising India. Uh, when I travel to New Delhi, as I'm sure is tr true for many people in this audience, I hear discussion from Indian strategists about the inherent, implicit uh, unity of interest between the United States and India at this time. And people don't like to use the C word, the containment word, but that's really what they're talking about. And I, I'd be very interested in, in your thoughts about, uh, about this. In a sense, it's in, in inherent in the situation no matter what anybody says. Uh, but what, what are the opportunities of it? What are the dangers? What do you think? Well, first of all, when we were competing with the Soviets, we were competing with someone that was openly proclaiming that our end is approaching, even setting a date for when they'll become globally supreme, pursuing programs that were highly hostile and were generally motivated ideologically by very, very articulated and explicit hostility towards us. And of course, we reciprocated accordingly. Um, I don't think the situation between us and the Chinese is of that kind. But I can see in that context how it would be in the interest of India to get us at loggerheads with the Chinese. Uh, but I think, given my sense of what is involved, which is a very complicated long-term development in China in a rather complicated Asian context, we don't need to slide down that path unnecessarily. So I am a little skeptical about some of these efforts to enlist us into some sort of a, 
anti-Chinese relationship unless I become convinced that we are in fact facing some sort of a hostile challenge. The challenge that I see at this moment in our relationship with China is more rooted within the United States than it is in the relationship. It's whether we can pull ourselves together, whether we can get on top of the problems that we face. Uh, can we reactivate the potential dynamism of our society? Can we begin to articulate effectively and compellingly a notion of a healthy society which doesn't define well-being purely in the acquisition of material goods? Can we begin to achieve a little more social justice in a society in which the extremes of social inequality are worse of all index countries in the world? The tiny percentage of the super rich owning an enormous share of total wealth and a growing number of the poor who are becoming poorer. And in that context, we're also, of course, concerned about our global power and to, in some cases in a manner that leads us into adventurism in which we start wars under false pretenses, totally false pretenses, and then get bogged down. And that, of course, then leads to a further escalation of the process and to the prolongation of the conflict. So a great deal of what besets us and handicaps us in the relationship with China is not because China is rising, but because, to put it very crudely, we've been screwing ourselves up for a fairly long period of time. Well, that's, that's powerfully said. I'm going to be pedantic and return to Asia for a minute, um, not to, not to d diminish the, the force of what you just said and ask you to talk a little bit about the, the, the map of the rest of Asia. Um, when people talk at conferences, meet at the CSIS, they'll talk about a rising China, they'll talk about the implications of a rising India as a competing, potentially competing power, but they'll sometimes talk about a, a relative decline in Japanese power. They'll also talk about, about South Korea as a, as a wild card. They'll talk about an increasingly assertive Southeast Asia, it's hard to know exactly uh, where the, the, the fault lines lie there. And I'd just be interested in your thinking out loud as a, as a longtime uh, uh, observer of these different pieces of the Asian story, uh, what your thoughts are about, about Japan, about South Korea, about, about the ASEAN world and where it's going. Well, I'll just make two points about it. First of all, I think that is a challenge that the Chinese have to think through very seriously. Uh, because in all of this talk about rising China, harmonious world, and all of that, these pieces that you rightly bring up don't figure very much. So they better think about it hard. Uh, but secondly, more, and more specifically, I think any talk of writing of Japan as some sort of a moribund state populated by you know, elderly people is just a misjudgment of what Japan is about. I think the Japanese went through a terrible experience in the last few months. But what has struck me from following as to what and how the, Chinese, the Japanese people are reacting, what has struck me was the courage, determination, uh, self-discipline of the, of the Japanese. And I think Japan is going to make a significant comeback. Maybe it's even a healthy jolt in a way because it's forcing all of the Japanese to ask themselves, how do we conduct ourselves in the world and how do we operate as a society? But they're asking it in a context of really impressive determination and self-discipline. I hate to think what it would have been like in the United States if anything like that had happened on the West Coast, let's say. And we have a little preview of it in terms of what happened in New Orleans when the place got ripped apart by the, our equivalent of tsunami and the violence and this thievery and so forth. Perhaps none of that in Japan. What? This is an impressive country with impressive people with a sense of its mission. I think Japan is now debating very actively what kind of a defense policy it ought to have, what kind of alliances it ought to have in Asia whether it should go into the Trans-Pacific Partnership, whether it should go into other forms of association, perhaps uh, uh, economic partnership agreement with the EU and so forth. I think this is going to give Japan 
a much needed kind of stimulus for a more active role in the world commensurate with the size of its GNP. It is, after all, the number three economic power in the world, much larger than any European country. Uh, so I think Japan should not be ignored in this context. Um, let me ask you about, about South Korea. Um, South Korea often flies under the radar in strategic discussions, but it shouldn't. What, what do you think? And I'd be as interested in your, how you'd assess this if you were a Japanese uh, policy advisor as a, as a Chinese. Well, I think I know what you're alluding to, and I think the continuing hostility between them is unfortunate. And I hope it begins to wane. And I think in this new emerging context, there may be some acceleration in that waning. But the South Koreans are a wonderful example of economic success. Uh, they're now in the top 20 economic powers in the world. They see themselves as a global player, which is an amazing change uh, in South Korea. And they have moved from an authoritarian model of rapid development to a successful polity that is generally democratic in its procedures. And in that sense, there may be a hidden example here for the Chinese that the Chinese haven't thought about. Because in the long run, one way or another, the issue of self-governance, which we define as human rights, um, is going to confront the Chinese unavoidably. Unavoidably. And I think the South Koreans, in a sense, uh, have demonstrated what might be some of the stages in that evolution. We talk in America often about American exceptionalism. And one of the um, parts of, uh, of Dr. Kitzler's book that I found uh, especially interesting was, was the d discussion of what makes China, China. Um, and there's some interesting, simple uh, analogies that are, that are used. One of them that caught my eye was the contrast between uh, our kind of intellectual framework as a chess playing culture where you know it's about victory you you just crush your opponent in chess or it's a draw uh, where the pieces are all out on the board where there's, a, there's something about chess that's highly rational in a in a in what we think of as our western way and the chinese fondness for a game that we usually call go that i gather is called wei chi from reading dr kissinger um, never having played it, I couldn't begin to understand it, but it's, you know, about strategic encirclement and kind of going where they ain't and a lot of that sort of thing. Uh, there's also in, in, this, in this book a lot of discussion about the Confucian nature of Chinese society, the sort of thing you hear from Chinese, you know, we're different, we, you know, we want, we, we want harmony, we, we want everybody just to kind of get along peacefully. And, and there is an evocation of this Chinese difference, uh, much more subtly than I, that little shorthand. Um, but it, it makes you ask the question, uh, you know, is, does, does conf the Confucian part of China overwhelm the Machiavellian part of human nature? There's a blunt way to put it. Well, that's a very good question. And let me first of all say, quite honestly, that I think Henry's book is really an erudite and elegant piece of work, and he has every reason to be proud of it. It's well written, it has some really wonderful turns of phrases, and it does enhance one's sort of intellectualized understanding of the Chinese, and I use the word understanding in the sense of acquired experience. I was never a student of China as such, and I bow in deference to those who were, but neither was Henry. Uh, and I think we acquired a certain understanding of the Chinese, and Henry grasps it and expresses it extremely well. The examples you have cited are the two ones on which I have some doubt, however. And I, therefore, <laughs> preface my comments by saying something that I've just said, and which I really mean sincerely. I'm not sure that one can push this conflict between chess and go too far. Uh, the Chinese are known for playing the game subtly and over the long haul. But if they have the opportunity to produce a decisive, one-sided, sometimes extremely assertive, if not to use the word brutal outcome, they do so as well. 
And so the notion that you know well, we let me, play. Let me push you on that, Zbigniew. What's what's an what's an example? That's precisely the point that some people would contend. Well, I'll give you an example: Uyghurs, Tibetans, Mo Mongolians in Inner Mongolia right now. I mean, these are things which are resolved by the Chinese without playing go <laughs> with an outcome like in chess. <laughs> you know, somebody gets it, and the result stands there. And we have also learned to play the other way. We didn't win the war in Korea, but we were satisfied with the outcome. Mm -hmm. We didn't go all out for a victory like in chance. We settled for that in Vietnam. Do you want to make a bet about Afghanistan? <laughs> I'm, I think we're all taking, looking for the go outcome there. Yeah, so, so I have some uncertainty about that. And the other uncertainty, and here I'm really on tenuous grounds, and it's not a criticism of Henry or disagreement with Henry, it's really more a question mark the Confucian aspect. It certainly is there. But I was struck in reading Henry's book that he refers to the monument that they have put up in, in, near the Great Hall of the People to Confucius. And that was very, very suggestive and made me wonder repeatedly what it means. I erased it with Chinese leaders. And I noticed they were always a little embarrassed about it. Can anyone in this room tell me where that monument is today? Well, it just disappeared. It's no longer there. Now, these things don't happen by themselves. Uh, the embalmed, embalmed body of somebody else is still in the great hall of the people. Um, and there's an interesting debate surfacing right now in China about the relevance of Maoism. I think it's a strained argument, but the relevance of Maoism to the current economic success of China. And there's been a book recently published you know, on the sort of economic prospects for China by a Chinese scholar, a rather interesting book actually in which he predicts categorically that China will emerge on top. And he gives a great deal of credit to Mao Zedong, not terribly much to anybody else, uh, except current leaders. <laughs> uh, so, uh, <laughs> Clearly this is a go player. Yeah, so uh, I, I just don't know whether the Chinese are really that fundamentally different from us. Uh, they operate differently. They have a very different style of personal negotiating I'm sure Henry experienced it as well, namely when they want to put you ill at ease on some issue, they all of a sudden burst into this kind of strange, unpredictable laughter <laughs> in which you have a sense they're laughing at you. So obviously you begin to think, what did I say that was so stupid? <laughs> but I think it's all this kind of gamesmanship. They also become sometimes very vividly angry and I don't think that's entirely emulation. I think sometimes they really do let themselves go. And you sense that in the public outbursts of Chinese nationalism, how emotionally aroused they become. I experienced that not only in the negotiating process, but even in meeting with Chinese students, where we talked about various things, Peking University students, and their desire for democracy, more app, uh, open internet, freedom to travel, choice of leaders, and so forth. And then Taiwan came up, and bang, all of a sudden, all of them got very angry and very, really nastily ugly. It wasn't contrived. So there are certain cultural patterns that differentiate them. But ultimately, I think their statesmanship is wise. It's prudent. It's patient. Uh, maybe those are the discerning differences. But I don't personally, since I do play chess, think that it either negates the relevance of chess to their own strategy, nor our ability also sometimes to be cleverly duplicitous, deceitful, patient, willing to proclaim victory when we barely avoided defeat and so forth. Let me ask one last question. I've been looking for John Hamry, um, so I'm just going to go by my watch, which says it's 3.30 and time for this panel to end. John. Yeah, I well, I, I as, as big one, one more question. One more, one yeah. more question. Yeah. So, uh, and this is a question that I, I'd, I'd love uh, to hear Dr. Kissinger answer to at some point. Um, reading this book uh, is to be startled again, uh, even though you've read the story so many times, about what creative diplomacy can do. Uh, as Dr. Kissinger says, the, at the end of the, the first meeting in 1971 with Zhou Enlai and recalls on the last page of the book, 
this, this will shake the world. Well, what we're doing here as diplomats, the opening we're creating, will shake the world and transform possibilities for both countries. And so my question to you is, is there any diplomatic opportunity you can see at this moment? Anything that genuinely creative, out of the box American diplomacy or statecraft could do? You've already answered part of this, which is clean up our own mess. So I want to ask you to project it abroad. That would, that would change the fundamentals in a way that we'd end up saying, we sh have sh we've shaken up the world here. Are you talking about the American-Chinese relationship no, or more generally? I'm, well, that could be talking about that. I'm really asking you in whatever direction that, that, that I was thinking more broadly. Well, but. yeah, but I think that will divert us to a totally different subject, which I don't think we're here to discuss. I'm convinced that our policy in that part of the world, which now on the map has to be drawn from the Tunisian-Libyan frontier uh, to the Chinese frontier, at Xinjiang, our policy in that entire sector of the world is self-defeating, counterproductive, damaging to our interests, and really posing on, the histor on history's agenda the question mark regarding our role in the world in the future. This is where I think we are off in the wrong direction, but that takes us elsewhere. When it comes to America and China, I think what Henry started, and working with Nixon in a brilliantly creative way, which was then consummated uh, some years later by, if I may say so, Carter, um, is uh, of fundamental importance uh, to our well-being. And this is why an intelligent management of the American-Chinese relationship is not only in our interest, it's doable. Henry's book is a very significant contribution to making that possible. And I think if we stay on that course, we'll avoid an unnecessary catastrophe, and maybe we'll be in a better position to deal with a self-created catastrophe, which is now in the process of mushrooming. And this is why I do think we have a serious foreign policy dilemmas on our hand, but it isn't the Chinese one. That's the perfect note on which to close this session, so join me in thanking Dr. Brzezinski.